it, it discover, we discovered it when we were talking about anti-vax conspiracy theories. And that what I was about to say was that even though I've been doing this job for so long now, when you find a new way of opening up a conversation, when you find a new way of approaching a, an old subject, it's, 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 for me, it's wonderful. It's one of my favorite things about this job. And it's born of empathy. Someone you love is in a place that you hate, whether it's conspiracy theories about uh, coronavirus or whether it is this bilious, xenophobic hatred of, of refugees that's now being fermented and fostered right across the country. And someone you love is in a place that you hate. That's a universal pain, something everyone can understand. Everyone can get their head around it. Everyone can begin to approach it. But it's only... 48% of the battle, isn't it? The other 52% is, is working out how to get them out of the light. And I haven't got a Scooby-Doo on that except to keep talking about it, to keep telling the truth, to keep taking the abuse and to keep insisting upon the facts because there is truth and there is untruth. And if you hold on to the truth, even if you are the only one, you will not go mad. Lottie Morley's here now with your headlines. It is 11.34. It is a question really for the ages. The uh, a, a, a simple question of, of what's it like to have someone you love in a place that you hate. And, and today we're talking about the anti-refugee bile that is swamping our country once again, inevitably, given the, the state of the political landscape. I, I mean, I, I would have said probably start the clock from the minute Liz Truss left, because this is such incontrovertible evidence of the disaster, the self-inflicted disaster that the country has embarked upon, whether you want to take it back to Brexit or just simply having a prime minister who was essentially enacting all of the wet dreams of the secretly funded lobby groups masquerading as think tanks that have been allowed to infiltrate politics and media to an absolutely unbelievable degree. That's literally what happened. That Liz Truss got into power. She did everything they wanted. The Daily Mail called it the best budget ever. You had people queuing up at the Daily Telegraph to describe why finally we had a conservative in place. And it didn't just fail. It failed on a scale that you ordinarily associate with a, with a, with a broken country, with a banana republic, with a failed state. What the hell are they going to do next? We asked ourselves. And then we answered with a heavy heart. Oh, they're going to have to go back to immigration. Like, what on earth can they do? Because the people that demand your trust are the people that told you Trickle-down economics would work. Liz Truss would be a brilliant prime minister. That mini-budget of Kwasi Kwarteng's was superb. They put it on their front pages. It's even my, it's even my Twitter profile, I think. So important is it that people remember it. The, uh, had at last a true Tory budget. So all of those people who flogged you that absolute skip fire desperately needed to, to distract you from that. And lo and behold, there's a refugee crisis to talk about instead. Amazing, right? It's like clockwork. It's like insidious clockwork. Eleven, And once you can see it, as people who listen to this program can, it is a little bit like being in the crowd with people next to you cheering the quality of the emperor's robes. But you can see, and you're not embarrassed now to say, that he's stark rollick naked. Uh, Zanel is embarking. Zanel, what would you like to say? Uh, hi, James. Uh, big fan of the show. Um, I'm just giving you a call today just to give the listeners... Um, uh, kind of like I want to show them what it's really like coming from a uh, background of a refugee or, or asylum seeker. Um, well, not myself, but my my parents were, and I, I was uh, here at the time with them while they were asylum seekers. And uh, I know a lot of people think that we get everything handed to us and we come here, we get given a house, we get given this, we get given that. I don't know how but many that, people do think it, but enough people think it for it to be a problem. Yeah. as we've discovered today. And uh, it, the, the, the reality of it is actually quite harsh. Um, you know, when we came over here, I was young at the time, and I've, I've seen my parents fight through it. And we, we came over here, we were put in a hostel, and my dad had to find, you know, he was working three jobs at the time to be able to afford um, food for us. And then we eventually got a house, but not a house through being given to us. We had to go into private rent and he was paying for that and you know he came here because the quality of life back home is incredibly horrible really compared to to here and he came with the dream of being able to create a life not for himself but for for us so we can we can grow up and have a life for ourselves here 
I, 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 I'm, I'm embarrassed, really, on a patriotic level that you feel the need to explain this or to justify yourself. But, but, but I understand. I understand why you do. What happens in your life when the toxicity gets ramped up, like it has this week? Because I, I, I'm a great believer. As a consequence of doing this job, Zanel, I, I can see the tides rising and falling, and, and I know that when the front pages are full of, for example, complaining about Polish shops or, or, or complaining about one in six people being born somewhere else, the lives of people who live here, who have uh, a family background involving immigration or asylum seeking, they change a bit as well. Can you tell that the, that the mood is changing in the country at the moment, or is it still early days? I think I think the, the mood is the mood is changing, but you know, coming from I think there's a lot of people who they don't realise what it is really like from the perspective, and they they listen to a lot of the media and they listen to what he, she, and they said, you know, and um, I think that's something though. Right? I mean, if we take it back to an earlier caller, it, 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 you know, if I'm struggling and and you and your family move in over the road, and no matter how hard your dad is working, if you've got a better car than me, I can understand, I can see how that will be a little ember of resentment that could be turned quite easily into a flame, even if it's not got anything to yeah. do with the the hard, cold facts. You know, even if, even if you hadn't come from overseas, people envy their neighbours. Don't they? They, yeah. they, 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 they yeah. say the happiest man is the man who lives in, in the biggest house on his own street. <laughs> There's, it doesn't matter what's on the next street or what's on the other side of town. If you've got the biggest house on your own street, that's the that's the recipe for success. So there's no way, really, of lancing. I, I just sit here naively some morning saying, how can we fix this? How can we help? But you can't fix envy and you can't fix resentment, no. can you? It's no, strange. No, of course not. No. And I've been listening to you for the past three years now, and I, mm. I never miss your show. And I've never felt such a need to to call in, you no. know, to give people a perspective of what it's really like and the harsh reality of actually being in this, you know, part of asylum seeking family and having to work uh, double as hard as uh, the normal British person just to be treated the same. Yes. And uh, every, everything that we have, it's none, nothing's been given to us. You know, we've had to work twice as hard just to be able to be treated the same and you know my dad came, he came here with this vision of being able for for his children to have a good life not not for himself or not here to you know take people's jobs and not here to show off it, it, it was for us no and, and and your experience and your existence doesn't in any way tell people who were born here and who are struggling that they are not struggling or that they are not working hard or that they are not Working three jobs is no, it's not. I mean, it's this, it's the rhetoric of competition that we, that we all, you're not, you're not falling into it, but I can imagine someone listening is you become, well, I work very hard as well. I don't, so it's just this, I don't know what it is. It's like a big lump of gristle in our national conversation called Nigel. A massive lump of gristle called Nigel. How do we get it out? And you know, someone needs to do the Heimlich maneuver, really, because it's, it's, it's now fair to say that that manifesto I read from 20, um, was it 2010? from the British National Party, could come straight out of the mouths of any member of the current Conservative front bench. Andy's in Newcastle. Andy, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, a lot of the rhetoric and the conversations um, that have been going on today and, well, in Cabinet um, reminded me of a friend I used to play rugby with um, yeah. a couple of years ago now. I uh, was scrum half, he was fly half, so we were close. Um, <laughs> yes. We talk a lot. It's like um, the first line of a country and western song, that. I was, I was exactly. scrum half, he was fly. <laughs> go on. We go well with Scrumpy. Yeah. But um, he was, uh, he'd swallowed every line there was to swallow go on. on this conversation. He was only 18. He had a, um, he was proud to get out his UK membership card, um, Saturday socials, mm. and we, we'd always get into loggerheads about it. And he'd say, he used to say, we pay the way for them to go from dinghy to grooming gang. Um, okay. Things like that. Yeah. What really upset me wasn't how young this had taken over him. It was the fact that he spent most of his Sundays and some midweeks um, training a Syrian refugee to play rugby. Um, who yeah. had no other friends um, at the time when he started. He just turned up to the rugby club to make, try and make friends and integrate into society. Everything we're told they don't do. Um, um, very little English, and well, and I always think, I always think, name. I always think of the mayor at this point. Actually, I was the mayor of London, who you can't get much more integrated than being elected mayor of the 
country's mm-hmm. capital city, but the kind of people who say, well, they just don't integrate, they just don't integrate, are oddly the yeah. kind of people that are queuing up to abuse Sadiq Khan whenever he's on this programme. Well, but this is it, and he, he would abuse Sadiq Khan mm. and say things like that, or people of, of like that who he didn't know, yeah. and yet he had a perfect example. He went out of his own time, he took his own time to train him on his own, one-on-one, that's his decision to do it, to help him integrate, and I'd say, I'd say to him, look, mate, well, what about Ali? You know, yeah. he's great. Yeah. You know, this is this is the only example is it, of a refugee you know. Um, and he just smirked and go, oh, yeah, but you know they're out there, the other ones, and that's what's really going on. But, but then, if he'd got his way, then Ali never would have come here either. It's that it's, it's no. always the way, isn't it? Is, is you can find one. I always use star signs at this point. No one's ever going to believe that if you find one dodgy Capricorn, you should somehow get rid of all the Capricorns. It was one of the Trump family talked about M&Ms, didn't they? And, and, and talked about if you've got one dodgy M&M, you should chuck away the whole bowl or something like that. It's so, it's so yeah. stupid. It's, it's, that, it's and that so is condescending because it is stupid. I mean, what other word can you use to describe stupidity except stupid? In theory, he was a massive racist. In practice, he was a lovely bloke. Yeah, I get um, that. I and understand His that. group of training became, you know, free refugees no, and, uh, no and an Arabic immigrant. Um, he loved them all. And I, I, you'd always know that if anything kicked off ever at the pitch, side of the pitch when it boiled over and one of them got touched, he would lose it and protect them like it was well, his own well, son. Well. Isn't that amazing? But How is he now? Well, I mean, I, I sense we're not moving towards a happy ending here necessarily. We lost, we lost touch. I left the rugby okay. club due to a lot of them views being around and I yeah. couldn't keep fighting it and I and, and, yeah, coaches, and, and that's know, why we have was, the conversation yeah. like we're having today because you know that given the I mean I, 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 they, 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 he's a good man he's just believed bad things there's a difference he's not yeah. a bad man he's not he's not making money out of it he, he genuinely believes it mm-hmm. and then he, ge- go on, he genuinely believes it but he'd never practice it oh. um, while it's at arm's length and it's a theory and it's a ghost in his head um, he's all he, he, he can say what, whatever it is, and it's not that he's a coward, but it's no. in practice. He's, he, his natural warmth, his humanity, comes back out again, um, and that was what chilled me because he's, like, he's eighteen, and yet this and is so done. deeply ingrained in him yeah. that not even physical evidence can budge the needle. Yeah, and, and that, that that is a mark of how stubborn these positions are. I, you know, even as I mean, that's the oh, I don't mean you. Hey, I don't mean you. That's, it's, it's, I remember we stumbled across it. I don't think I'd come across it before Brexit because look, I'm a white, heterosexual, middle-class, privately educated man. I'm literally the least discriminated against section of society in the history of humanity. But I, I remember stumbling. I said, oh, I don't mean you. It was a mother-in-law talking to her own daughter-in-law. So we voted to get rid of the immigrants, but we don't mean you. Uh, and that, that, uh, that is the mystery. Well, it's not a mystery because the distorting lens of media. I said something mildly warm about the sun earlier. I suggested going by front pages that they're nowhere near as toxic as they used to be. And quite a few of you have drawn my attention to a story about the quality of the hotels that asylum seekers are now being put up in, which takes us back to earlier conversations. It doesn't matter what the help looks like. Even if it was a one-star hotel, people would be successfully encouraged to get cross about that. And then you get the next bit. You get the line about, well, they shouldn't complain about anything. They should be grateful for anything they can get. And you just think that's not how you talk about humans. It used to be a Christian country. 10 to 12, mystery hour on the way. Shortly after 12, we're expecting quite a significant announcement with regard to interest rates, which we will obviously take. Um, and then mystery hour will get underway in earnest. Some breaking news for you at this time. Uh, Imran Khan, the former Pakistani prime minister, has reportedly been injured in a shooting attack targeting his supporters as they marched on the capital Islamabad. Uh, An unidentified gunman reportedly opened fire on the vehicle carrying Mr Khan as it passed through Wazirabad. Um, This has been reported by Pakistan's Dawn newspaper in the last hour. Uh, One broadcaster has gone further and said that Imran Khan was shot in the foot. In fact, I can see that that's on the BBC now, that one broadcast, uh, that Imran Khan has been shot in the foot during this gun attack in uh, in Wazirabad, part of the Pakistani capital, Islamabad. More on that as as and when it appears, but um, uh, those are the details that are currently available. Matt's in Canterbury to steer us back to this question of people you love in places you hate. Matt, what would you like to say? Uh, hi, James. Oh. Um, I'd 
I thought I'd offer a perspective because um, I heard the lady that was talking about free cars. Yes. I'm an EU migrant myself. Um, I invaded the country in 2004. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, the perspective I'd like to offer is because I, I actually used to work with unaccompanied asylum seekers for a number of years. The conditions that these young people are housed in and the support or lack of thereof that they receive, mm. I don't think you'd want to wish that on anybody. I mean, we had kids show up to um, to the educational provider that I worked for um, without any money for meals. Uh, some of them had to walk 10 miles, um, you know, to, to get the education because the um, authority couldn't sort out the travel passes. They are housed, I don't know if you know that, but most asylum, uh, unaccompanied asylum seekers, which are people under 18, yes. are housed without any supervision at all. I so didn't know that. I didn't know that. So there's about four young people in a, in a flat, which is most of the time in an appalling condition, and they're not supervised. Now, imagine one person... That's costs, out of that. right? That's, that's, that's costs, that, essentially. That's, say, that's a money-saving exercise not to have care and, and, and supervision in place, I imagine. I can't think of any other... I, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I think it's due to the lack of actually any sort of centres in the county that I worked yeah. for um, um, that offer sort of supervised kind of, like an, I don't know, like an immigration kind of centre sure. style um, accommodation. So basically what they do is they rent out um, flats around, you know, larger towns, mm. uh, and and these people, young people, um, live there unsupervised. So that so, turns into a into a they're just they're just marauding around the community un, un 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 unattended, unsupervised on the one hand, and then if they were supervised, it would be we spend X thousand pounds a year nursemaiding yeah. <laughs> these. This is what I, I thought. I, I I mean, I don't want to keep returning to it, but I did think that that the call you refer to was incredibly helpful in the sense that whatever help is provided can be turned into a negative if you're starting oh, from yeah. this position so if they oh, were yeah, they, they if they were supervised yeah if they were supervised we'd be complaining about the cost and if they're not supervised we're complaining about the fact that they're wandering around unchecked can't well, win the, you can't the, win the sheer, unless the sheer, they're not the here sheer fact, the sheer fact that there isn't any proper structured support for these young people means that very often they fall into um, yeah. You know the life of crime. They got recruited. They get recruited by um, gangs and whatnot, um, and and they fall out of education and they can't provide uh, so we contribute to to this country at all. At the same, you know, on the, um, at the same time, there are loads and loads and loads of kids who actually do their best. They work their socks off. They walk ten miles to school, um, and just to get a better life. And they do go on to university and do do get on to you know go on to get careers. Now imagine sure. if. There was proper support. Yeah. How many yeah. of those young people would have actually gone into, you know, the economy and and pay their share? So you look at. I mean, I listen. I, I'm no expert, but I I, I, I know differences. You look at Germany or Canada, and this attitude that you you maximise the potential of the people coming here, and and Angela Merkel's announcement about Syrians, uh, that the million Syrians that were invited into Germany. T Trudeau today is talking about, I think, 400, just, just shy of half a million people that came into Canada last year. It's just so, so stupid. Mm. For a country that's struggling economically to, to have any access whatsoever to new people who can address or, or, or redress some of the problems we've got with our birth rate, some of the problems we've got with an aging population, with a retired workforce, with quiet quitting, with huge numbers of vacancies. And, and the challenge for politicians should be to maximise the potential of the people that are here, however they got here. Let's maximise their potential. Let's turn them well, into as valuable citizens as we possibly can. And we've got a government that's dedicated to trying to chuck them out. I'll, I'll, I'll share another piece of perspective because mm. I've actually started working with immigrants and asylum seekers around 2007. So around 2007, the budget for ESOL, which is English for, sec um, yeah. for speakers of other languages, was around £220 million. Pounds. Now, what that meant, if you arrived in this country, you could have walked into any further educational provider and you would have been given a, um, a course mm. in, in ESOL, in English which meant that you could have 
you know integration you get, integration integration isn't it absolutely yeah absolutely now when it's from 2010 i think in 2010 alone and we all know what happened in 2010 that budget was slashed by 50 percent yeah in, and then what do in, they expect so then you have less integration less less assimilation and and i, I mean listen i don't do tin foil hats matt and you're closer to the action on this one than i am mm. but it's hard not to think it's deliberate, isn't it? On some grand scheme of things, it's hard. I mean, well, I what, what, what I would they be doing? Way, to be honest. No, <laughs> this week, right? This week, after the disaster of Truss, Sunak's already flip flopping. He's got an absolute liability in the Home Office. We should not be talking about anything except the dire domestic political situation. If there wasn't a refugee, if there wasn't something that can be portrayed as a refugee crisis, what the hell would they be doing? Well, to be honest, it's a consequence of leaving the um, European Union, but in a way that, for example, before the referendum, it was people like me who were the scapegoats because we were taking up jobs. We yeah. were take, taking our space on the M25 and speaking foreign on trains. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I got told numerous times that my kids are taking up places in, in, in you know, the indigenous people's um, Did you? schools. Gosh. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm, you know, I, I get the whole, it's not you treatment and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's just because they can't fall on that. Uh, anymore because they've left the EU. Um, so all they have left now at the moment is refugees. It's got to go for, we've got to go for the being. refugees and, and the, the, we've got to go for the ones in the boats because we've shut down every other safe route. If you want to know what a safe route looks like, ask a Ukrainian. It's doable. It's easily doable. The choice not to do it, I, I'm, I'm with Matt increasingly. It's got to be political. What could the other reason be? And, and just for the record, to drive home Matt's point, the top 10 non-UK countries are to... to follow up this horrible piece in the mail about one in six. Uh, so that includes by one in six people in, in the country not born here. That includes the King's dad, the Prime Minister's dad, the Home Secretary's dad, the England football captain's dad and the England cricket captain's dad. And I've chosen those five examples simply for, for pithiness and ease. So the Daily Mail is, is, is outraged. One in six of us born overseas. Without mentioning, that includes the King's dad, the Prime Minister's dad, the Home Secretary's dad, the England football captain's dad, and the England cricket captain's dad. If you're going for the tests rather than the one days. I think there's a different captain for the one days, but there's no need to go that pedantic on this. And there it is. Thank you for that. It's good to know that, uh, you know, that's a good one. We'll end with this one. It's like sticking your finger in your eye and blaming your finger. It really is. And, and if you think it's an accident that this is back all over your front pages, then I've got a bridge I'd like to sell you. Some breaking news for you at this time. The Bank of England has increased the base rate of interest from two and a quarter percent to three percent. A pretty hefty increase, which Justin Urquhart Stewart, the co-founder of Regionally, the Regionally investment platform, will will just talk us through. The biggest single increase for thirty-three years. What does that mean, Justin? Uh, but what it means is anybody who's got a mortgage or planning to get a mortgage will actually find the cost of this is actually going to be going up. Um, and this may not be the end of it. There may be some further rises to, to come through. But this is a very um, dramatic. It certainly is dramatic. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, we, lo we lost you a bit there. I think I think we may have lost you on the word Sorry. dramatic. My apologies. That's okay. It is a certainly seen like the, something like this for uh, really two decades. What it means, of course, now, if you've got to say a mortgage of say £150,000 and you've got a uh, rate going from two and a half to three percent, where if it's bearable, uh, then you could find yourself maybe paying an extra fifty to seventy pounds a month. Uh, and bear in mind, these have already gone up this year, and there may be more to come as the Bank of England has been rather slow to react to inflation mm. coming through. Um, tries to put up rates in order to try and slow the economy down, which is of course diametrically the opposite to what certain politicians have tried to do with their mini budget, which is actually trying to speed the economy up. Yes, so this is the problem we got at the moment. The global <laughs> economy is slowing. You're dealing with inflation, but how do you deal with it with the one tool that actually is going to encourage the economy to slow down? That's the problem. But the people it's really going to hurt mortgage payers, and I'm afraid a lot of people took up mortgages when they were very low rates, yeah. good value. Those are emergency rates. I'm afraid rates. It will be going back to three, four, maybe five percent. And uh, I mean, that's going to be a much bigger deal than it was last time. I mean, people will be thinking of the 80s and the 90s, but the proportion of our income that we spend on property now is so much higher than it was last time interest rates went nuts that, that 5% these days is equivalent, I think, to, to double figures back in the 80s. <laughs> 
Absolutely right. And of course, the other thing, knock on effect on this, and you really don't dare, dare, uh, dare tell anybody, is that actually it's made the parts of the housing market may suffer because what then happens is people can't afford to actually buy these houses, so the expected value will start to drop. Or even worse, some people, if they've got a, a mortgage which runs out, if it's a fixed period of time, may not qualify for a new mortgage because yeah, the rules have changed. And they become a forced, they become a forced uh, seller. Now, that's going to be quite a rare issue, but nonetheless, uh, personally, very painful. What do we all have to do now? Well, we have to plan for some increases and also try and think about your asset, your property, and try and get the family to try and support you. Doing it on your own is very difficult these days. Mm. More financial family planning, not traditional family planning, uh, is actually far better. <laughs> Although we encourage both. Um, finally, uh, how much? Sorry. I mean, w- would, would we have been looking at this even without that mini budget, that that very odd, as you've described it, uh, uh, clash between uh, inflation yes. and interest rates, would we have been looking at this rise even regardless? Yes, absolutely, yeah. we would be, because inflation is at a, a, a record high for most people. They won't remember, sadly, old gits like me going back to the 70s, remember where we <laughs> nearly touched 25%. Uh. And seeing my father on a fixed pension and seeing a quarter of it suddenly just effectively disappear. We, we don't, people don't realise just how bad inflation can be. And then, of course, the government didn't really help either. Because some clever individual told Gordon Brown years ago, inflation's so low, why do we put our, a lot of our government borrowing on, intra, on uh, inflation-linked bonds? It's a brilliant idea until so inflation goes up. So this year, instead of having uh, interest on our government debt of being about 50 billion, which is equivalent to the old defence budget, or that's going to be much higher this year, it's now going to be closer to 100 billion, which is equivalent to the entire education budget. So I'm afraid this is uh, not very good news all the way around. One bit of good news. Go on. One bit of good news, and that is actually that the future pri- futures pricing for commodities next year is coming down, and so therefore it, there is some light at the end of an extremely dank and dark tunnel. But strap in is your advice. Absolutely. Tin hats, gentlemen. (laughs) Justin Urquhart Stewart. Thank you very much indeed, Justin, of course, from the Regionally Investment Platform. Seven minutes after 12 is the time. Time now for this. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Mystery Hour with James O'Brien. Seven minutes after 12 is the time. Uh, Mystery Hour is upon us, your weekly opportunity to uh, achieve the sort of satisfaction not ordinarily available anywhere else on your radio dial. And, and goodness me, I need it this way. I was two hours digging into the dark and murky depths of anti-immigration rhetoric and the impact it has upon people, upon families, upon good people, remember? It, it, it's the ones making money out of it are the real problem here, not the ones... Not the marks, not the victims, but we can park all of that. We can park politics, we can park interest rates, we can park the economy, we can park the bus and focus instead entirely upon our our, our weekly adventures into the unknown. Two things to point out. Number one, um, you're not allowed to look anything up. It's the only rule. If you hear someone else ask a question, don't look it up. This is a celebration of knowledge, information getting a bit worried about Celebrity Mastermind as well. So, uh, to be honest, it's partly revision for me, this. I, not that much ever gets filed under general knowledge. And the other thing I need to tell you is this. The uh, prize. The Mystery Hour ball game. Christmas is almost upon us, actually. So, the, the Mystery Hour ball game is, is about to start charging back up the board game charts. What better way to show how much you love your family than by giving them a Mystery Hour ball game, which you can buy from mysteryhour.co.uk or all the usual places. Um, but I give one away every week to my favourite contributor. And it could be someone asking a question or someone answering a question, even perhaps someone mounting a steward's inquiry into a question or answer that has already gone before. So, so there we are. mysteryhour.co.uk to get your own or chance your arm on 03456060973 in the hope of winning one. The full terms and conditions can be found at lbc.co.uk. It's nine minutes after 12. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Let Mystery Hour commence. Billy's in Livingston. Billy, question or answer? Uh, Question, James. Carry on. So you wear a seatbelt on a plane. You wear a seatbelt in a car. You do. You wear a seatbelt on the Dodgers and the Funfair. You do. Why don't you have to? Why don't you wear a seatbelt on a train? Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's just cost, and and the, how often there are accidents, it's just a sort of cost benefit ratio. But I'm not. Mm. I, I mean, I'm, 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 I like it. It's a good question. My daughter, my daughter, my daughter says it's because it's on a fixed track, 
Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But there well, you go. It, partly, I mean, the reason why there will be much fewer accidents than there would be on a road is is because it's on a fixed track. I don't. I mean, yep. between you and me. I, I, I suppose seatbelts on planes if there's turbulence and stuff like that, but there's some pretty grim theories that we've examined in the past on, on, on the usefulness of seatbelts on planes. But if, you, yeah. if we confine ourselves to road versus rail, the, yeah. the much, much, much lower incidence of accidents, the fact that you hardly ever have circumstances where the driver's going to slam the brakes on and we're all going to lurch forward like we do in the car sometimes when you're very grateful for your seatbelt. So it was probably that, but your daughter deserves more. She needs a definitive answer, Billy, clearly. Absolutely. And we shall endeavour to get her one. So it would be someone who works in train, train building, train engineering or sort of health and safety or whatever it may be. Thank you, Billy. Chris is in Dartford. Chris, question or answer? Good afternoon, James. How are you doing? I'm all right, mate. What's what's going on? Question. Yeah. What, 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 okay. Yeah. Not, not a lot. I just had a biscuit and a cup of tea. Thank you. Oh, Sorry, very yeah, nice. What sort of biscuit? Um, I had a shorty, an old-fashioned shorty biscuit. What? Very tasty. Actually. The, the round one with the kind of ribbed edges. Yes, that's the one. And the yeah, dots yeah. in the, and the dots in the middle. <laughs> yes. That's Good for the dunk. One, yeah. Nice dunker. Nice dunker. That. It is, it is, yes. Carry on. Okay, sorry, a uh, question. Um, yeah. I was debating with my mum last night. She yes. was born in the 60s, and she can't remember if she was christened when she was younger. Now, she got on the phone to her mum, who's still alive. She can't remember, and neither can any of her siblings remember if they were christened. So my question is, how can you find out if you were christened? Because she would have moved many times from where she grew up. How can you find out if you've ever been christened? Ooh, that's a I, that's a good question. I mean, you can find your birth certificate, can't you? And yeah, it's not on there though. Cause that only you can got find you... your adoption certificate, which I've had to yeah. do recently. Or you got births, deaths, and marriages. Yeah, but not um, Christian. But you can find. Christening. You'd need to know the church that she. Which is almost impossible, especially if you're young and you you've moved like I don't know six, seven times, and you're not even in the same town anymore. I think I think you're on a hiding to nothing here. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I don't think there would be a central register of christenings. But that's the question. Is there a central register of yes. christenings and baptisms? Because uh, her, her philosophy has always been that we were to get chris, christened so that it was easier to get married. But they've all got married, my mum and her family, her siblings. But mm. they weren't christened. Well, how would you know? Because you don't have to prove you're christened, do you? I don't think in a Sometimes, church. Not really, no. I, there might be some weird, obscure area in which... You do. I mean, I, I think there's one office of state you're not allowed to hold if you're a Catholic. I think it might be Lord okay. Chan. It might be Lord Chancellor, or, so, or they might yeah. have fixed that since I was a kid. But I'm pretty sure we got taught that at school. So okay. that's like a reverse proof. I mean, if she's really keen, she can get christened again. There's no penalty for doing it twice. Not of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I shall find. Okay. So, is there a central register of christenings in this country? Yes, thank there you. it is. Thank There's you the question for Chris's mum. Let's find out and uh, enjoy your biscuit. Twelve thirty. Well, he already has. Twelve thirteen is the time. Uh, Ben's in Chippenham. and Ben, question or answer? Question. Carry on. Um, so it's about fizzy drinks. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> um, in particular, I've noticed um, with Diet Coke or you know, it's really fizzy drinks. If you put them into an empty glass, it might fizz up a bit. Yeah. But if you have ice in it. Uh, if you start with a glass with ice, uh, it'll fizz up a ridiculous amount. Like, you've got to be really careful about how quickly you pour it, otherwise yeah. it'll start fizzing over. And yeah. I can't figure out why that is. Uh, surface area. S surface area, OK. Yeah, well, I'm just thinking <laughs> so logically was... here. Mm -hmm. But what is the difference between a glass with ice in it and a glass without ice in it? You're, you're thinking temperature. Yeah. But if you took your glass out of the freezer... I love doing that. Do you ever do that? Uh, yeah. Oh, is there nothing better, is there? Than a, I, I learned this. In, in, I learned it. It's not exactly an, an, an important <laughs> lesson, but in Greece, a mate of mine's dad used to keep tankards in the freezer, and we'd sit on the balcony, and and he'd bring out a couple of beers and a couple of frozen tankards. Oh my! There is no finer beer in the world <laughs> than a than a beer. Watching the Athenian sunset in a frozen tank. Anyway, I digress. The frozen mm -hmm. glass. Probably would not fizz up more than the unfrozen glass, would it? No. It now that leads well, me just, that leads me to conclude that it yeah. is not the temperature that is contributing to the extra effervescence, the excess of effervescence, Ben. It is something else. So that leads me to ask: What is the key difference between the glass with the ice in it and the glass without the ice in it? And the answer, the only answer to that question, Ben, would be surface area. 
Yeah. But I've noticed to <laughs> counteract that, I've noticed if you use vodka, yes. so if you have vodka out of the freezer, which is obviously cold, and you t- as it's fizzing up, you actually add uh, vodka to it. It completely cancels it out. Because so you, some- have, you have a, a, a lower concentration of carbon dioxide in the liquid that is ah. meeting the surface area. Okay. I can see that Professor Hall is rung in, so I'm probably going to stop now trying to answer this question in a deeply scientific fashion because Professor Hall will no doubt come galloping to the rescue. But I bet it's got something to do with the drink meeting a surface area and that is what releases the gas. Mm. Well, no, okay. you don't sound convinced. No, not really. No. I think it's, it's a waste of that. good vodka, by the way, putting it in with Coke. Vodka and Coke. Yeah. Yeah. I'm never, never entirely <laughs> sure about that, but, you know, horses for courses. Thank you, Ben. You're on the list. Fizzy drinks and effervescence. Great word, that, isn't it? Do you not love that word, effervescence? It's quite an effervescent radio programme, this, I like to think, on a, on a good day. On a good day. Uh, 12 16. Mystery Hour on LBC with James O'Brien. 12.19 is the time. Mystery R. Seatbelts on a train. And more people actually interested in buses. I hope Billy's daughter doesn't mind. The um, uh, buses are in a made more of a mystery. I think I think we've done that before, but you know me. I'm 50 now. Can't remember anything. Can't remember what I had for breakfast. Uh, christening. Is there a national register of christenings? Uh, and why do fizzy drinks fizz more when there is ice in the glass? Jim's in Dorchester. Jim, question or answer? Question, please. Carry on. I've just finished jury service at the Crown Court in Bournemouth. Have you? And, yeah, really interesting experience. You're not allowed to tell me. I, I, I'd, I'd love to know more, but I'm not allowed to ask you. There's all sorts of rules surrounding it. It, it is. I mean, but all of these cases, at the end of the day, are just family tragedies. So it's, uh, mm, it's never course. great. You know? right. Anyway. But the, um, the, the question is, is, why are there 12 people on a jury? Hmm. It felt a bit biblical, and it can't be. Uh, it can't go back that far. But well, you mean because of the how many apostles were there? Um, actually, here I'm exhibiting my ignorance. That's so am I now. I went. I went to. If you include Jesus, it was thirteen. But there were twelve. 12 oh, Judas, there were thirteen. So no, it's not that. Or is it? Maybe it's that. I, listen, I know it goes back to William the Conqueror. I know it's, it kicked off in about t- t- 1066, trial by jury. Prior to that, I think the local duke or the local earl got to decide who was guilty and who was innocent. But why 12? I do not know. So I shall yeah. ask, why are there 12 jurors? Uh, um, it, you'd think it'd be an odd number, wouldn't you, so that you could always have a result? Well, I guess that's why the judge then says uh, it could be a majority or uh, unanimous. Six you all, know. score draw. In some ways, he he determines it. Mm-hmm. No, you're on by twelve. It's, a, it's an interesting number. Was it settled upon arbitrarily? Does it have any biblical reference? Oh, it's not impossible. Stranger things have happened. I like that, Jim. And I'm going to cut. I'm going to move on only because otherwise my curiosity will get the better of me, and I'll start asking inappropriate questions about. I don't know why I find it so fascinating. The one time I actually sat in a courtroom, I I, I, I was on a school trip because I thought I might want to be a lawyer when I grow up. And what we always did at my school when we got out of school for a time is find a pub that would serve us underage alcohol. So we drank two pints of cider in about 10 seconds flat before we had to get back to the courtroom. And I fell asleep in the public gallery and I was removed by the sergeant at arms from the court because the judge noted not a happy moment. Professor Hall is here. Professor Hall, how are you? Hello, James. I'm very well, thank you. It's been a while. Have you been busy doing your TV stuff, have you, and your academic stuff? Well, actually, no. I've been um, quite busy lecturing to the Sosoboski Brigade in Poland. Oh, fantastic. Very, very sweet. About the general. Yes, and um, then I went straight from Krakow uh, at the Sosoboski Brigade to Scotland, where the brigade was formed and where it worked, which is also very delightful. And they've just opened up a General Sosoboski Way, an 11-mile route on the coast which joins up his bases. Whereabouts? Um, Fife, the Firth of Fife, uh, near Laven. Um, I'll um, I'll show it on. Twitter. How long is it? How long is the road? How long is the? It's, it's eleven miles. You said that. Your, so the, near Anstruther, Anstruther, near Anstruther, or 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 near... I don't know, buddy. It's Laven, Largo, um, all those places on the. It's just such a lovely view, and we went and opened it up, and it was oh. just delightful. Lovely architecture in Edinburgh as well. I don't know. I'm you're preaching to the converted on that one. That must have been lovely for you. It was delightful, although it was a real challenge going to the Sosoboski Brigade. I didn't want them thinking I was a young whippersnapper stepping in my great grandfather's so, boots. But these, these, these are not. I mean, the, the, what, what the, I mean, is it, I don't quite follow. Is it, is it? They're not still around. None of your. 
great grandfather's no. comrades are still around. So what is the Sosabovsky Brigade these days then? The, the Sixth Airborne Brigade, which is the, yeah. the current parachute brigade, is it's called the Sixth Airborne Brigade in the name of Sosabovsky. It's he still named patron. after your great grandad. Yes, and oh. everywhere you look, there's statues um, that are saluted as you walk by. There's oh. pictures. They have a lovely parade. And um, I was just quite anxious. They thought, oh, there's some uh, specky professor coming here. And well, you are. He, you are a specky <laughs> professor, but you're also the general's great-grandson. So I don't know what you're worried about. You can be both, you know. You anyway. Can, specky lecture, professor and, and great-grandson of military legend. It, well, the lecture was delightful. Though. Oh, Absolutely sensational. Delightful. I'd like to see it one day. I really would. OK, um, we'll, we'll arrange Let that. Know. Let me know. Anyway, where um, were we? Let's talk about some science. Let's. Um, putting up, pouring soda onto ice. Yes. Um, this is um, a, a version of the Coca-Cola Mentos experiment. What happens is the ice has got lots of corners and rough edges. And what that does is provide nucleation sites for the dissolved carbon dioxide to come out of solution. So it just kind of it just drops out of solution, uh, whereas in a clean glass, there are no rough edges. And there's lots of ways you can demonstrate this. And particularly if you're looking absentmindedly at a champagne glass, you might notice that the bubbles always seem to come from the same place on the glass. Mm. And even if you drink it and then refill it, it comes mm. from the same place. There's a little scratch on that glass you can't see, which causes the nucleation. And even when you put soda in your mouth and it gets all pleasant and sparkling, it's because your taste buds are forming rough edges for the nucleation. So less to do with surface area and temperature, more to do with lots and lots of rough edges. Kind of to do with surface area. The more surface area you've got, the more rough edges you'll have. Correlation is not causation, as you said several times. So it's, uh, yeah, all right then. So, uh, but, but anyway, it wasn't temperature. Well, yeah, temp no, it's not temperature. No, um, so I'll have that. I'll take that as a win. Okay. Um, it's, and in fact, because <laughs> I'm pathetic, have, um, frankly. Because I'm pathetic. <laughs> it is um, just along the road from Anstruther, as I pronounce it. I think locals <laughs> pronounce it Einster. It's just, it's just up the way from, from Einster. Okay, I know exactly. It's, it's a truly beautiful part of Scotland, that. Absolutely breathtaking. It is, and um, yeah, nice, nice deflection, and yes. Um, round of applause. Round, well, hang on, what are your qualifications, Specky um, Professor, I, boy? <laughs> I am the Specky Professor of Public <laughs> Understanding of Science at the University of Brighton, and delighted to be contributing to Mystery Hour from time to time. You're a renaissance, you're a, gen you're a true renaissance man, hopping effortlessly from military history, from ge genealogy, of course, in your case, the military history and the genealogy go hand in hand to... So there you go, to the public understanding of science. And I think confidently the, 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 the record holder for the biggest number of mystery hour rounds of applause. An unassailable position, I would argue. 26 after 12 is the time. Alexandra is in Romford. Alexandra, question or answer? Um, I have an answer. Carry on. Um, there is no central register for christenings. So if somebody would like to inquire whether they were baptised, they'd unfortunately have to go back to local churches um, yeah. and ask to go through the registers. Some churches will charge a £10 fee uh, for going they through like the archives. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. So, uh, yeah. So ah, no a clue. Register. A clue there to your qualifications. <laughs> yes, I am a priest. Uh, and, and so we work out where mum was born and then... Go, the further you go back, actually, the older mum is, I think she was 60, the more likely it is that if they were christened, it would have been in a nearby church. Because I, I, mm -hmm. then just you'd have to go through all of those records, find the relevant year, estimate what, th what's the average age? Three, four months? What, what, we... About usually before their first birthday, but yeah. that's changed now as well. And yeah. is, it, is it digitized in your church? Sorry? Is it digitized in your church? Uh, no, it's not digitised. It's all uh, written by hand, the registers. Holy um, I would say as well that theologically you can't be baptised more than once. What? Um, practically, <laughs> if somebody was unsure that they had been baptised, certainly oh, see, in the Church yes. of England, we would, we would do something called a conditional baptism. Right, you are, just in case. Yeah. yeah. I like that. Um, round of applause for Alexandra. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. I, I, I suppose God knows. Either way, whether you've been christened or baptised or not, and that's all that really matters. 28 minutes after 12 is the time. Alistair is in Cobham. Alistair, question or answer? Uh, a question, please, James. Carry on. OK, I was over in Dublin a few weeks ago, and there's lots and lots of gift shops um, down the down the, uh, O'Connell Street. And every time you go in there, you see um, Luck of the Irish um, um, souvenirs? <laughs> yes, you do. Why, why, why are the Irish so lucky? It's why not about it. I mean, it's a lucky? very good question, frankly, particularly <laughs> given the history of their relations with 
with Great Britain? Uh, yeah. Or, 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 Absolutely, yeah. I know the answer to this, believe it or not, because uh, I, okay. I, I am obviously Irish um, and, yeah, yeah. and soon to be even more Irish than I am now. Um, <laughs> and the answer is actually America and gold mining. The Irish were particularly adept uh, in the gold rush at finding gold and therefore the luck of the Irish became an American kind of meme and it then made its way back over the Atlantic to Ireland itself and, and, and therefore the luck of the Irish does have a uh, a resonance. Excellent. It's a thing. Excellent. So there it yeah, is. I'll take, yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that. That's, that's Ask right. me what my qualifications are. <laughs> Uh, what are your qualifications? I fully expect to be Irish by the end of this week. Next week at the very latest. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Round of applause for That's me. That's great. Cheers now, thank oh, you. Oh, mine, there you go. Mine, there you go. That's grand. Grand answer, that. Thank you, Alistair. So we still need to know about the jurors. We've done the fizzy drinks, done the christenings, and the seatbelts on trains and buses. It is just coming out to half past 12. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Lots of uh, lots of booze-related information coming into the studio. Guinness Guinness glasses, apparently, do not have imperfections. Like a specially tooled Guinness glass will not have imperfections on it because as it, as it won't fizz, it doesn't fizz. You have a different head on a on a Guinness, don't you, from what you have on a, on a, on a lager or an ale. Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines. Mystery Hour with James O'Brien. This is LBC. It is 12.33. So why are there no seatbelts on trains, brackets, or buses, close brackets? Why? Why is that? Especially the buses. I know that wasn't Billy's daughter's question, but the more I think about it, the more interesting that is. Um, Why do we have 12 jurors? What's the origin of the number 12 in the context of of, of juries? I'm pretty confident that the practice goes back to William the Conqueror in this country. It's different in Scotland, of course. I think you get 15 jurors in Scotland, which does away with the possibility of a, of a hung jury, doesn't it? Or at least minimises the possibility of a hung jury. I've done the luck of the Irish. So they're the only two, I think, aren't they? Seatbelts and, and, and 12 jurors, which means there's room for some more questions. It's only half time. 0345 60 is the number that you need. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where... The fun continues. So those are the two that need answers, and I need, I'd, I'd, I'd like some more questions as well. James is in Leicester. James, question or answer? It's a question, Mr. James O.B. Carry on, mate. Um, why does paying ease to the touch? When we bang something, the instant reaction is to, to put our hand on it and to lessen the pain. Um, an example, I, I, I picked my dog up recently to carry it down the stairs. She's a little bit old. Aww. And as I stood up, I banged my, my sort of... My sort of hip, Ooh. well, not my hip, my, my lower back on the window still. But I'm carrying the dog down the stairs, so I can't put it down. So oh. all I want to do is put it down and get my hand on it. And when I do get to the bottom and put my hand on it, the pain just instantly seems to either ease or go away. Temporarily, it comes back when you take your hand off. Well, a little bang like that, you put your hand on, and it seems a lot better. Yeah. You, you, you see the footballers rolling around holding their knees, and you just instantly want to put a hand on it, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I mean, I'm trying to think if there's an obvious answer to do with like blood flow or something. Warmth? Warms. The only thing I can think is heat from the hand. That's all I can yeah, think of. Same here. Sometimes it, it's just reassurance. I, I don't know. Sometimes maybe just reassurance. It, you, you just, I don't know. That's the question I've got, James. I, 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 I'm not, you're on. Why does why do why do you have an anesthet? Why does the touch, the human touch, have an anesthetic effect after a, after an unpleasant bang? Ooh. You're on. Are you all right now? Uh, just a mild little twinge. Yeah, it? no, it was just, it was, you know, as soon as I touched it, the pain was gone. How old are you, if you don't mind me asking? I am 32. Oh, you're all right for the moment, because you see, not long now, mate, you, there, there'll be a point <laughs> that you'll reach this weird point in life where every time something hurts, you, you find yourself yeah. wondering whether that's going to be one of the permanent ones. Can, can I just say, James, as well, I've read your book, mate, and I thought, I've read your first book only so far, and um, it was a really good book. I've never read Thank a book you. so quick. Oh. I didn't want to put it down. I've never written one so fast either. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's a lovely Take thing care, to say. James. And we have had echoes of it today as well, actually, how to be right in a world gone wrong as well. Um, Ray told us the story of what happened when he put his laptop away. A couple of things have popped up today that have brought that book back into my mind, and, and there is James. Thank you. Um, I love that. It's 12.36. John's in Falmouth. So pain and hands for James. John, question or answer? Uh, it's a question, please, James. Yes. OK. Um, you may remember in primary school during mm. assemblies in the, mor- in the morning, um, whoever was hosting the assembly would say, good morning, children. And the children respond um, by saying, good morning, Mr. O'Brien, in this weird kind of melody. Yes. And I'm wondering... Why they do that? Where did that come from? Why do people across the country in primary schools 
sing good morning back like that. I think that it is the nature of speaking in concert, isn't it? It's 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 because otherwise it would be disparate. It's a way it introduces a rhythm, which means that everyone is speaking in unison. Whereas if they okay. if they all did it separately, they'd all be starting at a slightly different point. Every so, do you see what I mean? So it becomes unified. But why? But why that particular haunting melody? Because it's easy. I mean, what would you? I mean, what do you want them? Do you want them to do it to green sleeves or something like that? No, 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 no. I mean, it's da 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 da. It's it's an up and down, isn't it? Da 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 da. Good morning. Yeah, I guess so. Da, da. So, I guess so. if everyone be, it did it, more, it just, let's be. do it now, okay? We'll say good morning, Mr. Keith. At this, uh, but we won't do it in a sing song way. All right, on three, one, two, three. Good morning, Mr. Keith. Good morning, Mr. Keith. See, that's an absolute mess, <laughs> isn't it? You got finished and okay. you hadn't even started. Okay. So, so well, whereas maybe, if we do it in, it let's more, do it now. Let's, let's do it in a sing song way. Ready? One, two, three. Good, Good morning, morning, Mr. Mr. Keith. Keith. And there we are. That's Bang on. Absolutely natural, perfect. Synchro- Thank you very much. Synchronicity. That's the answer. Synchronicity. Okay. Round of applause. I, guess so. I know he's not pleased, but I don't care. That's because I'm a maverick. Um, uh, thank you, John. And, and we can add to that if you want the headmaster's greeting. Good morning, Mr. Uh, Matt's in Middlesbrough. Matt, question or answer? Question, James. Carry on. I'm just curious as to why we don't uh, sneeze when we're asleep. I'm, I'm, I'm quite an allergenic type of chap, so when I wake up in the mornings, probably do, something to do with the dust. You do a lot I'm, of sneezing. Uh, sneeze, sneezing away, but uh, never once have I startled myself awake in the middle of the night by sneezing so it's a bit odd it is a bit odd I'm trying to think again what it, what would the reason be no you're on yeah we never yeah. said why well, because there's all the things that would make you sneeze they, they, they'd be in the the pollen or whatever it was or the dust particles would make you sneeze well they're around yeah. when you're asleep is it because you don't breathe in through your nose as much Oh, well, I think the, uh, the the snoring that I do, according to the wife, would probably... Yeah, so there's plenty yeah, of nose yeah, action. There's plenty of nose yeah. action going on then, so it's not that. There's plenty of that going on, yeah. That's, so that's... I mean, imagine just being asleep and, you know, mid, mid-dream and all of a sudden you wake yourself up with a horrendous I mean, sneeze. Everything that we're more relaxed, maybe, I don't, I mean, t- relaxed, sort of... Because I mean, you don't cough in your sleep either, do you? It's not just sneezing. There's lots of things you don't do in your sleep that you do. I think the coughing thing, I think my wife does cough in her sleep. Oh, does she so, really? Oh, it's yeah, not that. Really. All right, yeah. why don't we sneeze in our sleep? I'll, I'll try, she'll do my best to get an answer to that, Matt. I like it. It's a good it. question. Thank you. Thank you. So sneezing in your sleep. Good morning, Mr. James. Uh, pain, when you push something, when you touch something, you've hurt yourself and you grab it and it hurts a bit less. Uh, Seatbelts on trains and buses and 12 jurors. Gina's in Exeter. Gina, question or answer? I have an answer for you. Carry on. Um, you wanted to know why 12 members. Um, I it most actually certainly come... did. I did indeed. <laughs> okay. Well, I think I can help you. Um, I, uh, it comes back from um, the Crusader era. The Knights Templar um, picked it up over from the Middle, in the Middle East. And that derives from Sharia, which means 12-member jury. It's called Islamic Thief. And Lafitte translates the body of 12. Oh. And that, in turn, comes from the pre-Islamic practice of Bedouin um, consensus within a tribe. So in the desert, they would have a consensus before electing, let's say, a leader or a warrior or a commander. And they had to have the wise men sit down and they had to have at least 12. I, 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 I've got a problem with this. Uh, well, I do have sources for you, so that's okay. Uh, well, well, crikey, all right. Maybe I should think twice before. <laughs> Well, it's the origin, in Islamic origins of common law. I, no, I've got mean, no problem with yeah. that. I don't, yeah, I just, yeah, it's yeah. the Crusades that I'm questioning, because that would be oh. very, very late 11th century, wouldn't it? You're talking about the 1090s. Right, but pre... I'm not um, in law. My specialty is in the Arab and Islamic world. Yes. So I can't specify law, but the body of our peers, um, I'm not sure if that specifies the number of a jury. Right. So I'm talking about the I'm, I'm talking about the formulation. No, of the I, I understand, yeah. and I think I'm nitpicking because yeah. I mean I know yeah. I know that it came in while William the Conqueror was still on the throne, so that is thirty years earlier than than the sort that, of 
Crusades yeah. are. So right. it's, it may well have come from the Middle East, right. but not via the Crusades. Well, when did uh, we, we formulate 12? Is the, that, is I the, don't know is that. The pinpoint. And, right. and, so and I can answer 12. You can. And let's see if... But prior to, I mean, don't tell the Daily don't... Mail that trial by jury has Islamic roots know, because they will be campaigning to abolish it by tea time. Well, but that means that they would have to also sort of abolish numbers and the binary. Yeah, well, you know, and... give them a chance. Give, give them an inch. They'll, 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 take, they'll, take, they'll take. What about that? I mean, are we sure it has nothing to do with Dane law? Dane law popped up a bit in my. Uh... Well, you're asking. Tw- are you asking about twelve? Yes, or twelve. Are you Not about... juries. Yeah, twelve. Well, well, if we're going to go 12, you, went, you want the Islamic, the Arabic, the thief. Okay. And that body of 12. You're on, no? Around uh, qualifications? I'll tell you what, I will tweet um, the source for you. Thank like, you. I'm but what are your qualifications? What are your qualifications? I have a PhD in Arab and Islamic studies. There you go. A beautifully done. And a round of applause to go alongside it. <laughs> Thank you, Gina. Very nicely done. Keep it, everybody keep that under your hat, all right? Don't let them know that the trial by jury has Islamic roots because it'll be that mean. Crikey, could you imagine what will happen? 12.43 is the time. John's in Nottingham. John, question or answer? Hello, James. I've got a question. Hello, John. In multi-cat households, do the cats talk to one another, James? And, well, I mean, <laughs> they don't talk. Do you mean communicate? Yeah. Um, obviously, it's not verbal, but... If you're out of the house and uh, one asks the other, well, when are they coming back to feed us? You know, is is any of this going on? Because oh. we we just had a, a visitor uh, in our house recently of uh, of the feline variety, and um, he seems to be settling in really well. But I can just imagine him. He doesn't know how we tick, and he, he must be asking the other cat, well, what happens around here then? How does it work? And all these sorts of conversations. Um, we've got three. Different ages. We've got a new kitten. Oh, yeah. She's lovely, actually. Uh, I don't. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just thinking. I mean, they they seem to communicate, but I. I think they do. Do you? Well, yeah, but you're being yeah. a bit anthropomorphic, aren't you? If you don't mind me saying <laughs> maybe, so. Maybe a little I am. bit of a, a little bit of anthropomorphism goes a long way. I just thought I'd throw it out there. Yeah, I know, I, know, I know that you've got a doctor dog. I don't know whether you've got a doctor cat on the end of the line somewhere. Right. Could... We shall find out. We shall. Do, do cats communicate with each other? In, 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 I mean, I mean, they must have some forms of communication. It's... I'd, I'd have thought so. Yeah. All right, you're on. Yeah, cats. Cats and communication. Thank you, John. Lovely stuff. Twelve forty-five is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. We have got cats sneezing. Classes talking to teachers. Uh, pain and hands. And seatbelts on trains and buses. I've got a lot of work to do if we're going to clock, 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 cross them all off. I'll just put my teeth in and try again. Mystery Hour on LBC with James O'Brien. Call 0345 6060 973. 12.49 is the time. Apologies for a, for a brief break from Mystery Hour. Just for a couple more words on the Bank of England's activities this afternoon. You'll be aware of that uh, raise in the base rate from 2.25% to 3%, obviously very bad news for anybody on a variable rate mortgage or seeking to renegotiate a fixed one, but they they did go further. Uh, They believe that the UK is already in recession and that it's likely to be the longest ever, so that would be from the middle of this year all the way through to the middle of 2024, at which point they expect growth to pick up only to to an, an, an anemic rate, a very slim rate, about three quarters of a percent. Uh, Robert Peston, who um, was, of course, an economics correspondent before he was a political correspondent, suggests that Jeremy Hunt's statement, autumn statement on the 17th of November, is likely to make things worse, given that it is widely expected to be contractionary. Um, And he reminds us that we were supposed to be getting some sort of post-COVID bounce, but um, all sorts of... uh, Uh, warnings coming in from the Bank of England, not just the one about the recession, but the doubling of um, of unemployment moving forward as well. So, uh, you know, uh, there are massive issues at play here uh, right right across the world. It would be very silly to try and draw this back to one single influence or one single factor, but it will always be true. However much people may desperately hope and pray that it isn't true, it will always be true 
that imposing economic sanctions on yourself, whether as the result of having uh, a blemange in government or of having a stupid referendum, imposing economic sanctions upon your own country will always be a very stupid thing to do. And the worst, the worst things get economically, the stupider the decision to impose economic sanctions upon your own country will become. But we're still at least one, possibly two more conservative leaders away from any of them being prepared to admit that publicly, and they remain in charge. 12.51 is the time. Uh, Shlomi is in Manchester. Shlomi, question or answer? Answer Carry to on. the pain question. Oh, yes. So it doesn't actually take the pain away. Oh. You're just applying pressure to the area, which uh, gives you proprioceptive feedback, which is a very nice feeling, mm. um, and that makes you feel better about it. Why? Because um, it's just a nice feeling to the same area. But it's, it's only a nice point. feeling when you're in pain. It's not a nice feeling when you're not in pain. No, it's a nice feeling when you're not in pain as well. So that's Categorically, my isn't it? I'm doing it now, sir. I am literally applying pressure to my <laughs> solar plexus area and I'm not getting any pleasure out of it at all. <laughs> No, um, well, yeah, because you don't need that um, input. But like babies or people that suffer with their sensory systems um, do crave lots of input. So, oh. yeah, we cuddle babies up and people like that suffer Pro, with autism. Pro, pro, proprioceptive. Pro, proprioceptive. Proprioceptive, yeah. Proprioceptive. Okay. And, and it, so it, it's almost as if you've got a bad feeling and a good feeling in tandem and therefore it feels less bad than it would have done if you didn't have the good feeling going along with it. But in an objective, you could measure pain, the level of pain would be the same with or without the pressure being applied. Yeah, so, so pain's not an actual thing. Pain's something in your head, so they're both in your you head. You sound like my old PE teacher. You sound like my old PE teacher now. <laughs> but it's true. It can't be true. Nothing's actually happening to that part of your body. It's the sense that your brain's receiving that gives you the pain. Which pain is an evolutionary brain. protection against carrying on doing things that are going to hurt you even more. Correct, and yeah. similar. All right, qualifications. I like this. Good answer. I'm a final uh, year occupational therapy student. Congratulations. Have a round of applause. Thank you. If you fail all your exams, this will be a great consolation to you, Shlomi. I hope not to. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course you won't, mate. Of course you won't. Turn your radio off. Go and do some work. 12.53 is the time. Uh, Daniel's in Bournemouth. Daniel, question or answer? Uh, question. Carry on. Um, so, on really old doors, so if you think if you're going up to a clock tower yeah. and you go in, like, massive wooden door, maybe it's got those metal studs on, like a gothic door, the door, the lock on it, if you think you're putting your key in, it's upside down to how we imagine it. So you've got the round bit is at the bottom and then the narrow bit is at the top. Why? How many how, how many doors have well, you so researched friend, to make so this sweeping mine, statement it. about old doors? <laughs> yeah, I thought you were going to ask me that. I was going to struggle. So a friend of mine repairs a lot of clocks. He goes up a lot of old clock towers. He's literally his job. Um, oh, really? And he takes photos of them. Yeah. Okay. Um, he's based on the friends and stuff when I used to live there. He, him and his dad used to do it together, and I think his dad before that. And he's just got photos of hun hundreds of old doors where he's gone up to these clock towers and taken bits of them. And he, he noticed it first. And I went, well, if you don't know the answer, and you've seen these, and your dad doesn't know the answer, then I don't definitely know the answer. <laughs> so someone might do. So I thought, question I, question I was probably the best bit. And so that, and that is a thing. I mean, it is a, the, 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 it's not, I mean, it's it well. <laughs> multiple <laughs> doors, multiple doors appearing to have old fashioned <laughs> keyholes, as in not yeah, Yale's totally or anything like that. You'd imagine. But yeah, upside down. Oh, well, it wouldn't have been upside down then. We no, know we're down. doing them it's upside down, down now. Yeah. 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 But why are they a different way round? Yeah, I don't know. That's why Why they're a different way up. And the other one was going to ask when, but obviously they're only have one question. But I guess they'll try in. You're on. When they change. No, I like it a lot. They should try for a short time, but we'll try and find out for you. Carry, uh, thank you, Daniel. Why are keyholes either upside down or the why they're different? Why are old keyholes a different way up from new keyholes? Thank you all. Uh, Alex is in Shepherd's Bush. Alex, question or answer? I've got an answer for you, James. Carry on. It's the one about the cats. Oh, yeah. um, adult cats don't communicate um, by meowing. No. They only communicate with each other um, by their body language. Um, but they will definitely be communicating with each other. Um, I've fostered loads of cats, and they always show the new guy where the food is, where the litter tray is, all really? that sort of thing. Really? Yes. 
Oh, how lovely. <laughs> Absolutely, they do. And um, they actually, cats only learnt how to meow back in um, ancient Egyptian times mm. um, because they realised that humans were a bit of a pushover. And so they tried to mimic the um, the noise that sounded most like a baby because they noticed that that's when the humans came running. Really? Yes, that's what, I, that's what I've done. Lots of research into this. I've been fostering for years. I'm a crazy cat lady. Well, I don't, I don't mind that. But really, they, the cats learn how to meow to do impressions of human babies. That's what I've read. Okay. Um, you're on? Yeah, qualifications, lots of cats. Crazy cat lady. What, what, so, yeah, so you did actually take the question out of my mouth because I was going to say, why do they meow then? And that is solely to do with human interests, domesticated. Yeah, you, you, will, you will very rarely see an adult cat meow to another adult cat. They'll hiss at each other, but and they won't meow. they their the back, way, which is body language. Well. They're sending messages, but hey. they're sending them physically. I mean, in many ways, the fact that you've never heard a lion meow proves your point, doesn't it? Uh, and I used to work with lions. Did so you there's really? Another qualification. Yes, Did I you? used to volunteer in South Africa. Gosh, round of applause for Alex. Thank you. Fantastic <laughs> stuff. I love that. And we shall watch our cats with even more interest than we usually do moving forward. 12.57 is the time. And Kevin is in Berwick upon Tweed. Kevin, question or answer? It's an answer, James. Go on. So uh, you were right earlier. It's about the... Uh, the why you don't need to wear seatbelts on a train. So uh, you were right in saying that statistically you're much safer on a train than on road transport. But the main reason is the rate of deceleration in a train. Normally wearing seatbelts is to protect you from sudden deceleration. You can get injured. And yes, yes. But on a train, yeah, on a train, um, the deceleration, even under emergency braking or if it hits an obstacle, uh, the train's so heavy and long that you, you, it's, it's the rate of deceleration is still quite gradual. So even if you were stood on your feet and the driver was to apply the brake in emergency, the likelihood is you could still ski on your feet. There it is. So, yeah. so, so that answers the question about trains fairly comprehensively, but buses are going to remain on the list, aren't they? Well, coaches, you have to wear seatbelts, don't you? Yeah, but, but not on a bus. No, but the buses are stopped, starting all the time, like in a suburban area, where I suppose you're getting on and off the bus all of the time. It'd just be silly. And they, at, and they go at lower speeds, so it would just be silly. Yeah. So I don't really know the answer as such for buses. Um, no, but it makes just, sense. It'd be a right of yeah. palaver if you're having to take your safety belt on every couple of minutes as so you get on and you get off. and you. Uh, qualifications, Kevin? Uh, so I was a Eurostar train driver. Oh, fantastic. Round of applause. Yeah. yeah. How long for? How long for? Um, I was with Eurostar for 26 years. Um, retired. God, I didn't, even know, I didn't even know it had been there that long. I still think of it as yeah, being quite yeah, new. Yeah. No, 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 no. And I, I started uh, after the, the already about. So Fantastic. Um, no, I love that. Yeah. And, and it's earned you a round of applause. Um, I need to pick Thank a you. winner. I need to pick a winner, don't I? Have you got any thoughts, Keith? Any, any got a favourite? Anyone? Royston, you got a favourite? Anyone? No, nothing? No, it's just me paying attention again today, is it? Just me, yeah? I think I do this for my own entertainment. Uh, it's got to be the cat lady, hasn't it? I think. I mean, self-described cat lady. I would never use that phrase myself, I don't think. So, so um, was it, it was Alex in Shepherd's Bush, I think. She's benefiting slightly from freshness of memory. You know when they do a What Are The 100 Best Albums Of All Time and Robbie Williams gets two in the top ten because he's the biggest act in town. I'm going back a while now. But Alex in Shepherd's Bush, uh, there you go, you get it. Oh, um, some important business for you. If you have missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, where you will also find all of LBC's shows to catch up on, as well as staying up to date with the latest news from LBC. So download Global Player for free from your app store or just head to globalplayer.com. Uh, coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick, but now... It's time for Sheila Fogarty. 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 It's time for Sheila F